Thank you for joining me for this brief segment of our study entitled, Give Yah the Glory. Now, as the title suggests, in this segment, we will talk about the stage of salvation that scripture calls glorification. And we're going to be dividing this segment on glorification into three parts. So this is part one of three. And so as we near the end of our current study on salvation, it's been a, a broad study on salvation over these last several weeks. But as we uh, near the end of that, that general study, um, let's just review uh, the subject matter and uh, let's make note of the fact that what we have found in scripture is that uh, there are indeed three stages of salvation that are shown to us in scripture and these three stages of salvation are justification, sanctification, and glorification. And we've previously covered justification, and we've just covered quite a bit on sanctification. And so let's give some consideration now to glorification. In Hebrew, the word glory is kavod, and it literally means weight substance, abundance, splendor, dignity, or magnificence. And the Hebrew word for honor actually comes from this word for glory. Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory or some translations will say the esteem of Elohim, or the esteem or glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. End of quote. Now, generally speaking, in Christianity today, most would say that to give glory to the Creator is to give him praise. And although a spoken word of praise is certainly a part of the meaning of this word glory, scripture seems to give us even more insight into the way that we should understand this word. So let's look at a key verse it gives to us to know that there is more to this word that we need to understand. John 17, verse 4. I glorify you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. End of quote. Now, this verse is taken from the words of our Messiah as he prayed to the Father, the prayer that has come to be known as the High Priestly Prayer because he is our high priest. So here we see Messiah praying to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in this prayer, he is praying for his disciples, which when we really think about it, we are his disciples today. And so he was praying not only for his disciples at that time, that given time, when he was about to be crucified, but he was as well praying for his disciples, who, which includes us even today. And he was praying the words of this prayer at this point in his ministry on earth because he, he knows that the time is drawing near for him to be crucified and 
In this verse, he confesses before the Father that he has glorified the Father on earth. And he goes on to specify how he has done this. He says, having accomplished the work which the Father gave to Messiah to do. And so here Messiah gives to us to know that obedience in action gives weight or substance to our words of obedience. In other words, our acts of, of obedience give glory or weighty substance to our words of agreement with his word. And that's something that is important for us to stress in today's society, which has been so affected by Greek thought, where philosophy is king. Because in Greek thought, one can say what they believe, and that which they say determines who they are without necessarily having any evidence of behavior that says the same. And in the book called James, Elohim, or God, speaks to us through James and says, faith without works is dead. Now, we must note that not only does Greek philosophy have an influence in today's world, but also Greek thought had an influence amongst those Israelites living under Roman rule at the time that these words were recorded. And you know, that explains the statement that Nathaniel made in John 1 verse 46 where Nathaniel says can anything good come out of Nazareth and um, you know when we look at biblical history we see exactly why Nathaniel made this statement he was saying this because Nazareth was the area where most of those who were of the royal lineage of King David lived. And as a means of political control, this area had purposely become very Hellenized. And so James took opportunity to say here in, in these verses, you show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And he said this not just for the sake of the Gentiles, but as well for the Israelites who had been influenced by the Greek mindset that was very prevalent in their captivity to Rome. Because we, we have to remember that prior to Jerusalem being uh, taken captive by Rome, um, Jerusalem was taken captive by Greece. And Greek thought even had a stronghold in uh, the Rome, in, in Rome, amongst the Romans. So, because Greece was the superpower before Rome was the superpower, so to speak. So, uh, therefore, we, we can see as well how uh, another example of the influence of Greek thought, we can see uh, the example of how discipleship is a 
different method of teaching that engages one in being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. So a very different approach from the Greek mindset, which is about debate and philosophy. And, you know, that understanding about discipleship as being the method of teaching that our Messiah used um, is very much so missing in a lot of Christian churches today. Now, these two verses are among many which give to us the practicality of glorification. These two verses show us how that stage of our salvation that's called glorification actually comes about. So let's read them together. Starting with Romans 1 verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of Elohim revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. End of quote. And so James just explained to us that our faith is not a matter of philosophical thought, but rather what we truly believe is exhibited by what we do in response to the word of Elohim or the word of God. So faith is not just a mindset. It's not just a frame of thought or uh, faith is not just a mental assent to an idea or a philosophy. Um, faith is exhibited in action and James says it perfectly. Now let's read here um, 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord, which comes from Yahuwah, who is the Spirit. End of quote. And so here in this verse, reference is being made to Moses and how whenever it was that Moses met with Elohim or met with God, so as to receive guidance from the Most High, Moses would leave that meeting with the manifest presence of Yah, seen in the very face of Moses. And you know, I believe that the manifest presence or glory of Elohim was evident all over Moses. But I believe that um, Scripture records the uh, face of Moses as being emphasized as a reflection of the glory of the Most High because the face of a person in the natural is how we immediately recognize a person. And so the glory reflected in the face of Moses was saying essentially, when you looked at Moses, you saw the Most High. And so as we can see here, the word glory has nothing to do with praise or exaltation, but rather the word glory here is making reference to the manifest presence of the Most High. And 
as much as that was what was being said in this verse about Moses, how much more is that what is being said to us? Because on this side of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Messiah, we who have been born again live our lives continuously in his presence. And as we renew our minds with his word made operative in the way that we think, speak, and live our lives, we're being changed into the very image of Messiah. And an ever increasing weight, because remember that's, that's the definition of glory, it's a weight. And so as we are being transformed, um, it's by measure by measure. It's an ever increasing weight of glory or manifestation of the character of Elohim that's being recognized as being who we are. Because others will look at us and see our Messiah, Yahusha, or Jesus. And who is Messiah, Yahusha, or Jesus? He is the Word of the Most High, made flesh. Our Messiah was a perfect witness of the word of the Father spoken to him who lived in human flesh. And we are called to be a witness, although not always perfectly. Yet and still we are called to be a witness of the spoken word of the Most High living in flesh living in us. Hallelujah. Now, let's take a moment to consider the matter of prayer. Because prayer is understood to be a means by which to communicate with the Most High. And there is a verse which used to perplex me a great deal, and that's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, which reads, Pray without ceasing. End of quote. But then I came to understand that prayer is not just what we do when we close our eyes and fold our hands and speak to Elohim because prayer is a matter of our thought life, which of course is continuous, both during our awake hours and during our sleep time. And that is why it is so important that we commit to the process of renewing our minds with the word of Elohim, which then transforms us so that we, as a matter of process, see greater measures of his character at work in and through our lives, all to the glorification or manifestation of the name of the one who has saved us and is saving us and shall yet save us when he returns for us his Hebrew name Yahusha who some call Jesus it is he who reveals the Father to us how great and how wondrous he is And so the 
imagery that scripture presents to us is unmistakable. Time after time, this word glory is making reference to the manifest presence of the Most High. For example, when the Philistines captured the Ark in 1 Samuel 4, Eli's daughter-in-law named her newborn child Ichabod, which means, where is the glory, or without glory? Because the Ark was the place that Israel witnessed the manifest presence of the Most High. And so when the Ark was captured, she immediately lamented that this act signaled an absence of the manifest presence of the Most High amongst Israel. And the Septuagint, which is uh, the Greek translation of the Old and New Testament, adopted the Greek word doxa for the Hebrew word kabod to express that the word glory makes reference to a quality belonging to Elohim. So in other words, saying that it's not just about um, praise, but rather this word kabod um, was recognized as having significance in making reference to the true and living Elohim. However, we have to make note that in secular Greek, doxa did not carry this particular connotation because, of course, secular society does not make reference to the one true and living creator. And so in secular Greek, uh, Greek language, this word doxa or glory makes reference to a range of meanings from opinion and conjecture to repute and praise and its verb form is doxo doxozo and it can mean to think imagine suppose magnify praise or extol, end of quote. And so perhaps over the, the past 2000 years, it is from the influence of secular Greek in religious circles that the predominant understanding of the word glory has come to be a word that makes reference to praise and exaltation with not a lot of teaching on the original Hebrew meaning that includes praise and exaltation, but is primarily used to refer to the manifest presence of the Most High. And from the perspective of understanding what our salvation should look like, it's very important that we understand this point. Second Corinthians 4 verse 6 For Alihim who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of Alihim in the face of Yahusha. Messiah, or as some would say, as Jesus the Christ. Hen, O Shalom Meshpaka, favor and peace, family, or grace and peace. Well, this is the end of part one of three parts having to do with glory. In the next part, uh, or perhaps the one after the next part, we're, uh, we're going to include in this study uh, some matters that are going to be far more um, controversial. 
So I do pray that you will stay tuned. Um, it's not just that this is um, going to be some controversial material, but it will be some very um, important material for us to understand as we look at scripture. And once we look at it, uh, it's going to be very obvious. So um, thank you for joining me for this part. Uh, one of our segment uh, of study having to do with glorification. And I do look forward to um, your joining with me on the next segment. Grace and peace to you.